Thank you for joining the seventh virtual resident education lecture series today. Today's topic is pediatric headache. We have Dr. Daniel Weber, Adult Epilepsy Division Director at St. Louis University School of Medicine joining us as our Q&A moderator today. Dr. Weber started doing a virtual lecture series at the beginning of the pandemic on his own and has connected with the AAM to continue this resource for residents. I'm also pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Clarimar Borrero Mejias. And Dr. Borrero Mejias is a board certified pediatric neurologist. She works at the Institute for Brain Protection Science Sciences at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida. Her clinical focus includes pediatric headache, epilepsy, and tick disorders. In leadership, Dr. Borrero Mejia stands out for being a member of various committees with the Child Neurology Society, the AAN, the American Headache Society, and she's also a member of the Child Neurology Clinician Certification Committee of the ABPN. She's also a member of the Board of Managers of All Children's Community Clinical Integrated Network. Dr. Barrero Mejias, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. I hope that everybody can hear me well. I am very happy to have the opportunity to speak to you all. And before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the challenges that we, our families, our communities, and the rest of humanity and our planet continue to face in these historic moments and in these historic times. I would like to keep in mind the people who continue to struggle daily to survive in times of great instability and uncertainty. And I wanna remember that we have suffered the loss of many lives due to disease, hunger, violence, and the COVID pandemic. But I, I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge that my home and workplace reside on the traditional homelands and territories of the Seminole tribe as well as other Native American tribes, including the Calusa, the Tokamuga tribes. And today, the state of Florida is home to the Seminole, the Mikasuki, the Muscogee, and the Choctaw tribes. And I wanna acknowledge the individuals of many other Native groups. I think it is important to recognize the historical and continuing impacts of colonization in, indig in indigenous communities and their resilience in the face of colonial and state-sponsored violence and the opportunity that we have in promoting healthcare equity and social justice for indigenous peoples. So with that, I am generally very grateful to my Lord for the opportunities and blessings that remain day by day. And it is an honor for me to be here to talk to you all today. I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest to report. I will be discussing off-label therapies for pediatric migraine, which is the topic of discussion for the day. And I will limit my discussion to pharmacological treatment in pediatric patients in practical clinical use, and I will not include information on pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics. I will discuss information on some measures and our treatments commonly used for non-pharmacological management of migraine, although they may not have been rigorously studied. And finally, the images in this presentation were generously taken from the internet I do not own the copyright of any of the images or media used in this presentation. After attending this lecture, the participants should be able to demonstrate their ability to identify typical features of migraine and other primary headache disorders, distinguish features of primary versus secondary headache disorders, and know when to refer patients for emergent, urgent, and routine neurological evaluation, discuss indications for workup of headache, review treatments of headache in children and adolescents, identify instances when abortive and preventive therapies for primary headache disorders may be indicated, and understand and counsel patients on the importance of health habit modifications in the management of headaches in children and adolescents. It'll be important to also um, implement a headache therapeutic action plan that can be shared with their patients at school. And so as an introduction, the prevalence of headache is 37 to 51% at age seven years old. This increases to 57 to 82% during adolescence. In the United States, frequent or severe headaches, including migraine, were reported over a 12-month period of time in 17% of a national sample of children and adolescents. Most frequent type of recurrent headache in childhood is migraine. In adolescence, tension headaches are the most common cause of frequent headache. 
Migraine headaches can occur as early as a few months of age, and a higher prevalence of migraine is, is, um, seems to exist in city dwellers. Secondary headaches are the ones that are most frequently encountered before the age of five, uh, five years. Migraine occurs in three to five percent of young children and up to 18 percent of adolescents. The average age of onset is seven to eight years in boys and 11 years in girls. And migraine remains the world's second leading cause of disability and the first among young women. And I want to say that again, migraine is the world's second leading cause of disability and the first among young women. Migraine ranks third amongst the most disabling neurological disorders in the United States in terms of absolute number of disability adjusted life years or dailies with 2.40 million dailies. Migraine results in an estimated cost of $29 billion per year. Diagnosis and classification of headache disorders is contained in the International Classification of Headache Disorders third edition beta, which was endorsed by the International Headache Society and the American Headache Society. It is organized into three different sections, and today I intend to focus this talk on migraine as it is the most common and disabling headache disorder in children and adolescents in general. In 2005, Dr. Andrew Hershey and colleagues published data that supported making certain modifications to the criteria of the International Classification of Headache Disorders applicable to the diagnosis of children and adolescents because this improved the sensitivity of the diagnosis of migraine in this population to 88.4% compared to following or limiting the diagnostic criterion uh, to the typical classification for adults. Criteria to consider in pediatric patients includes the presence of bilateral headache, different from adults, which may be unilateral or most likely unilateral, moderate to severe pain, throbbing or pulsatile nature uh, that worsens or limits physical activity, headache duration of one to 72 hours, and nausea and or vomiting, in addition to two of the other five associated symptoms, which are photophobia, phonophobia, difficulty thinking, lightheadedness, or fatigue. I decided to highlight in red the characteristics that might seem different in pediatric patients compared to the typical presentations in adults. And it is important to note that migraine disorder is a primary headache diagnosis. Therefore, in practice, it is always imperative to explore the signs and symptoms that may point to a secondary headache diagnosis as the management and treatment will be different. Children may have difficulty communicating and describing their symptoms. So associated symptoms can be inferred from behavior. And it is always important to get some of the history from the parents and their observations are very valuable in trying to ascertain whether children have photophobia, phonophobia, especially um, as uh, they may not convey that specifically. As I mentioned, it is important to note that migraine disorder is a primary headache diagnosis. Therefore, in practice, it is always imperative to explore the signs and symptoms that may point to a secondary headache diagnosis as the management will be different. I wanna take a moment to talk about the diagnosis of migraine with typical aura. And here is the diagnostic criteria. A person will be diagnosed with migraine with aura if they have at least two attacks fulfilling criteria B and C. Criteria B is aura consisting of visual, sensory, and or speech language symptoms, each fully reversible, but no motor, brainstem, or retinal symptoms. And criteria C, at least two of the following four characteristics, at least one aura symptom spreads gradually over five minutes and or two or more, two or more symptoms occur in succession. Each individual aura symptoms lasts five to 60 minutes. At least one aura symptom is unilateral, and the aura is accompanied or followed within 60 minutes by a headache. Symptoms should not be better accounted by another ICHD3 diagnosis criteria and transient ischemic attack has been excluded. And this is where, when it comes to assessing and managing patients who have migraine with aura versus migraine without aura, the management and the diagnostic evaluation may be different. And so, I have included this slide specifically with the diagnostic criteria for chronic migraine to remind everybody that if a patient reports having headache for at least 15 days per month for more than three months, then this would be a situation where the patient 
deserves to be evaluated by a pediatric neurologist and neurohetic specialist. And this would be the diagnostic criteria for chronic migraine. While we continue to learn about the pathophysiology of migraine, we now understand that the pathogenesis of migraine disorder is not exactly related to a vascular phenomenon per se, but rather there is a cascade or sequence of events or a chain reaction that I summarize here. Briefly, it is now widely accepted that the migraine should be viewed as a complex brain network disorder with a strong genetic basis that involves multiple cortical, subcortical, and brainstem regions to account for the pain and the wide constellation of symptoms characterizing the attack. A phenomenon called cortical spreading depression may lead to an abnormal activation of trigeminal neurons, and there is release of peptides, one of which has become the target of several migraine-specific therapies, the calcitonin gene-related peptide, or CGRP, and this prompts an inflammatory reaction which increases substance P, neurokinins, and nitric oxide, which in turn can cause vasodilation and an increase in sensory input through the brainstem, thalamus, and ultimately the cortex. Considering that we have a better understanding of the pathogenesis of migraine, researchers have been able to develop targeted therapies for migraine in adults that have been FDA approved and are being studied in children. For the evaluation, history can establish a diagnosis of migraine. Uh, location, character, severity, quality, associated symptoms are important to obtain. Uh, triggers and psychosocial factors or stressors is important in the evaluation and, and getting the history for migraine. In the physical exam, uh, it is important just in general in the neurological examination to obtain the vital signs, do a skin examination, especially in children, head circumference in children, neurological examination, and always include a fundoscopic exam. I counsel uh, my, my peers and colleagues in pediatrics and others that if you're not able to obtain a fundoscopic examination, you can consider sending a patient for a quick optometry or ophthalmological evaluation for a dilated examination. Most of the time it can actually be easier to get in to see one of those specialists versus coming to see a neurologist or a headache specialist and their input uh, can be very valuable in deciding how urgently a patient needs to be referred to see a neurologist or a headache specialist. And so speaking of secondary headache disorders, here's a list of elements in the history and the signs and symptoms that should alert you that a patient may have a secondary headache. That is a headache secondary to an underlying anatomical, structural, vascular, or systemic cause. And specifically, again, in the history, if the patients report sudden onset in headache or an abrupt change in the headache pattern, thunderclap headache, which is instantaneously severe, a new daily persistent headache or positional headache, persistently focal headache or abnormal location of the headache, typically occipital uh, would be a red flag, as well as loss of vision. In the physical examination, this is just an illustration of what a normal fundoscopic examination would look and how papilledema may look as well. When I was doing pediatric neurology training, I learned the following mnemonic, Vindicate, which has been extremely helpful to remember possible etiologies of any neurological question, really. And while I don't know who created this mnemonic, I will give credit to Dr. Roy Patchell, an adult neuro-oncologist who shared this gem with me a decade ago, and I still use it. Since then, people have expanded upon this mnemonic, and there is now Vindicate Sleep, where vascular inflammatory neoplastic degenerative or deficiency disorders, idiopathic or intoxication, congenital, autoimmune, allergic, traumatic, endocrine, and now social, legal, environmental, economic, and psychological etiologies for a patient's symptoms can be and should be explored. Children with intermittent headaches or chronic headaches and a normal exam often do not require neuroimaging or additional workup. If there was a concerning finding in history or exam, an MRI would be the preferred imaging modality. And I would suggest that you consider sending patients to the ER for evaluation and head CT scan if there was an abrupt onset or a thunderclap headache. It is recommended to do brain MRI, LP uh, with CSF opening pressure and an ophthalmologic evaluation uh, in patients who have papilledema. 
And now I'd like to take an artful respite and a brief detour to talk about art. I'd like to take a moment to illustrate the power and clinical utility that imagery and art have in clinical practice. For centuries, people have taken to different forms of art to describe their experiences during illness. And at one point, neurologists Han and Ferrari flirted with the idea that Picasso's weeping women or women um, may have been inspired by his own history of having migraine attacks. However, after investigating uh, with time and researching his life, no evidence of such claim could be supported. Still, there are patients whose description of aura, pain, and neurological symptoms associated to their migraine disorder seem to coincide with depictions like the ones shown here. Dr. Oliver Sachs, neurologist who wrote a book titled Migraine in 1967, and it was published in 1970, a revised, uh, an updated version was published in 1992. And then in 1999, the edition's book cover illustrated here was published by Ballantine Books. And its depiction captures a visual distortion that many people with migraine disorder seem to describe. By the same token, children's art can be diagnostically helpful and relevant for physicians to be able to understand the experience of young patients and those who may not be able to articulate what they're feeling. In 2002, Dr. Carl Strafstrom, uh, who is the Director of Pediatric Neurology and the Director of Pediatric Epilepsy Center at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, published a study where he asked his patients to explain their headache in words, and then he asked them to draw a picture of how they see the pain in their head. He then distributed 226 of such images to other pediatric neurologists, blinded to clinical history, with instructions to rate the picture as consistent with migraine or non-migraine. He then compared their ratings with each patient's clinical diagnosis. And this study revealed that drawings containing an artistic feature suggestive of migraine, like pounding pain or photophobia, predicted the clinical diagnosis of migraine in 87.1% of the cases. In a follow-up study, he found that patients' drawings can be used longitudinally to track headache severity over time, and that these drawings correlated with the effectiveness of treatment. I hope that artful display and discussion was entertaining while being educational, and I hope it did serve for a little bit of respite. Now let's shift gears and talk about therapeutic management. The treatment of migraine in children and adolescents should be multifaceted and include the following components. Strict adherence to healthy lifestyle habits should be emphasized. This includes ensuring proper hydration, not skipping meals, following proper sleep routine. It is essential to teach patients and their family how to work on identifying headache triggers, as well as educating them about abortive and preventive management, both at home and in school. Providing the patient with prescriptions for rescue medication for school use is important. And in addition, it is important to understand when to consider prescribing medication to prevent both frequent episodic migraine attacks and chronic migraine attacks. This, uh, these treatments should serve to reduce the frequency, the severity, and the duration of the headache, as well as decrease headache-related disability and prevent progression into chronic daily headache. It will also be important to consider whether acute treatment, acute treatment for headaches are ineffective not tolerated or contraindicated, and properly adjusting through frequent follow-ups visits will be necessary. In addition to assessing and managing pain, it is important to address disabling headache symptoms like nausea, vomiting, dizziness, and fatigue, as there are methods for measuring disability that have been validated, which can be utilized to track whether a therapeutic plan is effective. And if there are significant disabling symptoms, especially if they affect school attendance and performance, then preventive medications should be considered. Finally, in order to ensure comprehensive management of patients with migraine, it will be important to assess and address the psychosocial comorbidities that may be present and incorporate evidence-based approaches that attend to the patient's thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. And we're gonna look at these in more detail. Treatment of acute and chronic migraine aims to decrease the frequency, severity, and duration of headache attacks, as well as improve response to acute treatment and improve functioning and reduce disability. We can educate our patients about migraine management using the acronym SEEDS, maintain good sleep habits, 
exercise regularly, eat healthy and regular meals, drink water, and keeping a headache diary, as well as incorporate strategies to manage and reduce stress. In clinical practice, as far as acute pharmacological management, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, tryptans, and anti-emetic medications are used individually or in combination to treat acute migraine attacks. I have included here those tryptans that have been approved by the FDA, pointing out age restrictions. And in my practice, I usually recommend risotriptan to patients under the age of 12 years. However, due to limitations imposed by some medical insurance companies, Triptan selection can really vary and can be driven or guided by the drug form that the insurance company agrees to approve. A Cochrane review published in April 2016 concluded that triptans as a group are effective in relieving pain in children and adolescents. Specifically, the sumatriptan naproxen combination was found to be effective in treating adolescents with migraine. With that said, given its vasoconstrict constrictive properties, triptans are contraindicated in patients with migraine with brainstem aura, formerly known as basilar migraine, or patients who have hemiplegic migraine or Raynaud's disease, uncontrolled hypertension, ischemic cardiomyopathy, and other cardiovascular comorbidities. In 2009, the American Academy of Neurology published a summary with practical guidelines for the management of acute migraine attacks in children and adolescents. They reported that there is sufficient evidence to support the efficacy of ibuprofen and acetaminophen in treating migraine in children and adolescents, and that triptans were effective in treating migraine in adolescents. Specifically, the level of reliability that adolescents may feel full resolution of their headache within two hours of medication intake, so long as they take it at the onset of the headache, is high when using sumatriptan and naproxen combination or when using the nasal somitriptan. This study highlights that no treatment was effective against the associated nausea and vomiting symptoms, and that some triptans were effective in, in improving the photophobia and phonophobia. Finally, the study points out the importance of using treatment as soon as possible. At the beginning of the attack, use the route of administration that is best for the needs of each patient, meaning that if a patient is very nauseous, maybe they need the oral disintegrating tablet or a nasal spray, and uh, it also advised on the importance of improving health habits, including avoiding triggers for the attack and avoiding medication overuse. As recently as April of last year, Dr. Kenneth Mack, a pediatric neurologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, published a summary and recommendations on acute man management um, of migraine in pediatric patients. In this summary, he emphasized suggestions on the sequence of drug selection for the treatment of acute migraine, dividing them into the following categories, analgesics, painkillers, triptans, and antiemetics. He then listed tiers or levels in which treatment can be selected based on the severity of the symptoms that the patient is experiencing. In other words, for severe symptoms, the combination of naproxen, risotriptan, or sumatriptan, and promethazine would be recommended. Preventive therapy should be considered in patients who have frequent headaches, meaning more than one headache per week, high disability from headache, poor response to abortive treatment or overuse of abortive treatment. That means more than two to three doses of analgesics or abortive therapies per week. In children, topiramate and amitriptyline are the most commonly used migraine preventive therapies. In 2016, the Childhood and Adolescent Migraine Prevention Study, known as the CHAMP study, was a large multi-center double-blinded study that evaluated the effects of amitriptyline and topiramate against each other and against placebo in children ages eight to 17 years old. In this study, there were no statistically significant differences in reducing the frequency of headaches or the disability score in any group. The results of this study highlighted the potential and or power of the placebo response in pediatric patients. And with that said, in the past and since then, there have been other studies and publications that have found statistically significant difference in efficacy of these therapies compared to placebo. 
So based on the available data, I think it is important to include this information when counseling patients, make sure that they are aware of the nuances of what this means in order to make an informed decision regarding their treatment when they choose something for prevention. In addition to pharmacological therapies, there is very good evidence that non-pharmacological clinical management, specifically through the incorporation of CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, will be effective in reducing the number of headache days and disability associated with migraine attacks. There is a consensus among physicians who specialize in helping and treating patients with headache that it is important to incorporate CBT and other validated non-pharmacological modalities like biofeedback, meditation and yoga, and um, into comprehensive multifaceted treatment plans, and that these should be initi initiated concomitantly to initiation of medications without delay. So now let's talk a little bit more about prevention. With the use of monoclonal calcitonin gene-related peptide or CGRP to prevent migraine attacks in patients with chronic migraine, um, this has been studied and several agents have been approved uh, for use in adult patients while not in pediatric patients yet. In 2018, a set of clinical recommendations was created through a collaboration between the pediatric neurology members of the American Headache Society. By consensus, the group agreed that the long-term safety of CGRP antagonists has not yet been established. They mentioned that there are specific considerations in the pediatric population that should be rigorously investigated and risk-benefit ratio can be weighed with, um, before deciding to, to give these medications to people under the age of 18. And, and they recommended or encouraged that formal clinical trials be done. The authors point out that it is reasonable to consider these new agents in certain cases in patients under the age of 18, as I mentioned. However, in general, it should be necessary to consider whether the patient's disability is high, whether the patient has failed two or more other preventive medications, and whether the puberty process is over, as there are considerations related to bone growth, and, um, and that's, of course, important in pediatric population. Now I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight the importance and value of educating healthcare providers in the community who can help ensure that a therapeutic plan will be effective. Through a collaboration between Johns Hopkins and Ch Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, this study published in 2000, 2019 reviewed data to compare the efficacy of pediatric migraine treatment in emergency departments before and after implementation of a comprehensive migraine initiative. This included a standardized treatment protocol, an educational series for providers, and a standardized template for medical documentation. These initiatives improved the efficacy and efficiency of migraine treatment in the pediatric emergency department. Specifically, a significant reduction in headache score was demonstrated with a higher percentage of patients achieving a 50% pain reduction. And in addition, they found a significant reduction in treatment time in the intervention group compared to the pre-intervention group. To achieve the goals of therapy, it will be important to educate patients and their parents and ensure that they feel empowered and ready to prevent and manage acute migraine attacks. Specifically, it is important to educate patients about eating, hydration, sleeping, and exercise, as well as guiding them on considerations related to changes in the school environment. Finally, as I mentioned before, it will be important to address psychological comorbidities, mood, stressors in the environment that can precipitate or contribute to migraine attacks. In terms of diet, uh, we know that prolonged, period, prolonged periods of fasting can contribute to precipitating an acute migraine attack, and many children and adolescents don't eat breakfast or decide to eat unhealthy foods in the morning, sometimes because they don't want to get up early or they are in a hurry to go to school in the morning, while others may not have healthy foods available to them. And so this is a barrier that can be overcome either by guiding families to finding appropriate resources for healthy foods or advising patients to do meal prepping or meal planning the night before so that they always have a reliable breakfast in the morning. 
What is more, um, with prolonged periods of fasting, there is resultant ketosis, and this may be another trigger that can precipitate headaches and migraine attacks in some children. It is necessary to ensure then that the patients establish a routine with regular meal times and snack times. And I like to stress that there are people who can be predisposed to having migraine caused by certain foods, like a food trigger. However, it is not necessarily true that a food or a compound always causes headaches in migraine in everybody, or that there is one person who has multiple food triggers for migraine. Instead, there are some individuals who can recognize that there are some foods that trigger headaches or migraine attacks for them. And so going to or developing or logging possible food connections may be valuable, but quickly it should be that the patient identifies without a question that yes, this food triggers a headache for me and not necessarily that multiple different foods do that. It is also valuable to know that there are certain dyes, cheeses, cold cuts, alcohol, um, as other foods containing monosodium glutamate that seem to be commonly triggers for a lot of people. And um, as far as triggers for migraine attacks. In terms of hydration, there's nothing that can substitute water really. And ideally your patients should drink potable water um, or they should know how to heat and prepare water. We have a lot of patients who um, get their waters from wells. So it'll be important that they understand how to prepare their water to drink it safely. And, um, and we recommend that patients take 250 ml or about eight ounces of water per 10 kilos or 22 pounds of weight. I urge my patients to prepare water with lemon or fruit or sometimes even salt to change the flavor if that is going to be more appetizing for them and more encouraging for them to drink it. And for some of my patients, what I do is I recommend to measure the total amount of water that they need to drink in a day and plan to bring that big container with them at all times. Um, for the younger kids, I tell families to, I tell their parents to consider doing a reward chart where if they reach their goal of amounts of cups of water per day, or if they reach a goal of eating all of their meals, they get stickers and at the end of the week, they get a little reward. So depending on the age and the developmental stage of the child, um, there can be some incentives that work in helping people develop healthy habits. And so I must admit that I'm a coffee lover and moving to Florida where I'm now uh, is a real, treat for me. Um, at every corner, there's a wonderful coffee place. And while genuinely it is discouraged uh, that children drink coffee, some children do find that it is something that helps them during a headache attack. So especially for the older kids, I do say that if they want to try it for a little bit and they feel like consistently it is an adjuvant for the um, non steroidal medications that they're taking as far as uh, relieving the headache, then judiciously, um, I look away if my patients say that they are drinking coffee um, as, as part of their you know, preventive or I guess should say abortive regimen. And so I think we need to talk about sleep. This is important. Um, allowing for adequate sleep plays an important role in reducing migraine attacks. Fernandez de las Penas and his colleagues found that people who slept less than eight hours a day showed a higher prevalence of migraine. The National Sleep Foundation recommends that school-aged children should sleep nine to 11 hours each night and that teens should sleep eight to 10 hours each night. A consensus statement from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine was published in 2016 with age-specific recommendations emphasizing the amount of sleep needed to promote optimal health in children and adolescents. And so scientific evidence strongly supports the importance of exploring and identifying sleep disorders in patients with headache. Headache management should identify and treat sleep disorders as this can improve or resolve even the headache disorder or the headache problem. And to accomplish this, it is important to get a good sleep history, ask if the patient snores, if they sleepwalk or sleep talk, if they're restless in bed, if they sweat a lot in sleep, or if they get up frequently in the middle of the night uh, and ask about daytime sleepiness. To this end, the patient should be educated to sleep at least eight hours every night. 
And specifically, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has established recommendations for patients by age range, and those are illustrated here. Um, the recommendations emphasize that the schedules should be regular. Patients should sleep during the hours of the night, since there is evidence that certain neurotransmitters and substances that contribute to achieving restful sleep are influenced by the circadian cycle and the absence of light. And so I recommend and tell my patients to avoid electronics, strenuous exercise two hours before desired bedtime. And I urge them to practice strict sleep routine, such as going to sleep at around the same time, using the bed and the bedroom only where they're going to sleep, not having night lights, TV or radio at bedtime. And in cases where my patients share a bedroom or the bed with somebody else, I urge everyone to practice same habits or I invite them to look for other ways and other spaces where my patient who's having a lot of headache can have their own um, comfortable, quiet, dark place to sleep on, um, even if it's a mattress or a cot on the floor. And it's important to mention also that there is literature that suggests that children who have mild respiratory sleep disorder or snoring without apnea, for example, may have comorbidities associated with behavior, headache, or other health problems. And so even if you're a light snorer, it will be important to explore how that may be causing or contributing to having a headache disorder. Sleep disorders are treated a lot of the times with surgery that remove the tonsils and the adenoids, but sometimes that's not sufficient. And children need sleep aid medications, not like the adults do. Um, and other children may need CPAP machines. Physical activity is important. It is recommended that patients exercise for a minute of a minimum of 60 minutes a day, at least five days a week. It is not recommended that the activity takes place after 4 or 5 p.m., which is unlike what we all practice here with having um, sport activities in the evening, but especially if a patient is having a lot of chronic headache problems, it would be encouraged that they limit their activity to, to earlier hours in the, in the day. And if patients who have chronic migraine or chronic pain, uh, chronic pain, or those who may have other disabling physical conditions, um, neurological conditions, it will be important to incorporate an evaluation and recommendations from a physical therapist, because as Children with disabilities um, may face challenges that others don't. Um, it'll be important to, to incorporate techniques or, or exercises that they um, continue, can continue engaging in. It is also important to ensure that patients receive help and resources needed to be successful in school. The patient and the school personnel should be clear about the abortive therapeutic plan to use for acute migraine headache and they also need to be aware about other health habit modifications and reasonable accommodations related to extra time, rest, extra help for homework, projects, and exams. The accommodations set in school should suit each individual patient's needs. I have patients who have a lot of photophobia, so I say go ahead and wear sunglasses in class. I have patients who have a lot of phonophobia, so I say go ahead and when the teacher is done speaking, wear your noise cancellation device or ask to be put in a desk outside of the room or go and finish your work in the library. So those are reasonable accommodations to advocate for. This is, I think, one of the ways in which we can turn this invisible disorder into a more visible problem that the, into a more visible problem that it is to patients. And by involving those at the school, the patients can find the support they need wherever they are. Finally, I think it's important that um, patients can be assisted in the management of stress at home and in other social settings, given that a chronic illness can affect the patients and their family, their social interactions, and, and their emotions. The American Migraine Foundation has a plethora of resources for physicians, nurses, school, and patients. So I wanted to share this link for your reference. And there are other um, uh, resources too through the American Academy of Neurology. Finally, it is important to address the psychological comorbidities, moodiness, environmental stressors that can precipitate or contribute to migraine attacks. Um, at the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned that the pathogenesis of migraine includes the integration of pain as a peripheral stimulus into the cerebral cortex. 
And repeatedly, this will turn, transform the negative perceptions into negative behavior. And what is more, our thoughts, feelings, uh, emotions, behaviors influence each other. So by means of utilizing different psychological modalities that can help modify our thoughts, our emotions, and behaviors, a patient can transform or lessen their painful experience. So emphasizing that mind-body connection and the natural and adaptive processes that we can learn can really transform the patient's experience, including their pain experiences. And so cognitive behavioral therapy is one of those modalities that we recommend that has been studied and validated in adults, but also in pediatric population. Cognitive behavioral therapy, um, calls for cognitive training, that means modification and distraction, for example, and behavioral change strategies with relaxation techniques, feedback or biofeedback, activity rate control, and adherence to a management plan. The effects or the benefits of cognitive behavioral therapy are directly proportional to the time when the therapy is initiated, meaning the quicker that you engage in it, the faster or better the response will be. And, um, I present it at the onset when I'm seeing patients for the first time in consultation. I tell my patients, if you really want me to do the best that I can do for you, I'm going to tell you the list of things that have been validated, proven to be effective. And I want to make sure that slowly but surely, if you need to take a minute, but I want to make sure that you plan to incorporate all of this in your, in your treatment regimen. And I think it is important to recognize the stigma that comes from you have to see a psychologist and a psychiatrist and overcome that stigma, just presenting it, uh, the information to patients in a very neutral way and sharing with patients. Um, what I do is I share with patients my understanding of we all can benefit from strengthening our thoughts, our feelings, and our emotions. Um, and, and especially if you have a health condition that is taking a toll in your life to this degree, um, I think it is extra beneficial to put more of those um, uh, tools in your shed, uh, which will help you with coping with your condition, but also coping in life. So that's a little bit of how my conversation goes with my patients. I am also sharing with you some non-pharmacological management clues or ideas or tools that help patients. Keeping a headache diary can be helpful, even if as patients recognize um, they may not necessarily say or think that things are better. However, when they see a trend for less amount of days of headache or less symptoms, that puts things into perspective. Um, and then at some point, we also talk about not just focusing on how much pain I'm in or how many days of pain I'm in, but rather what things am I able to do today that I was not able to do before or what things uh, uh, are giving me pleasure today that I, I did not find pleasurable before. So that time, um, mind frame shift can be helpful in improving the quality of life for our patients. This is another of those tools. Again, this is meant to provide information for patients about migraine and suggestions of what to do, but also keep a log of the symptoms that they're having. And so I'll take a few minutes to talk about the future and future opportunities. I think it is important to know that, uh, to note that access and quality of medical care within the United States of America and around the world is not the same. Therefore, I think we have an obligation to advocate for equal access to therapies for children and adolescents including advocating for the implementation of more scientific trials that are ethical, well-designed, and that include pediatric patients. The Best Pharmaceutical for Children, I'm sorry, the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children's Act or the BPCA became law in 2002. The overarching goals of the BPCA are to encourage the pharmaceutical industry to perform pediatric studies to improve labeling for patient, um, for patented, patented drugs uh, used in children by granting an additional six month patent exclusivity for those who engage in this research. For NIH to prioritize therapeutic areas and sponsor clinical trials and other research for off patent drug products that need further study in children. There's another law called the Pre PREA law that became, uh, became law in 2003, and it gives the FDA the authority to require pediatric studies in certain drugs and biological products. 
studies must use appropriate formulations for each group. And the goal of the studies is to obtain pediatric labeling for the product. In the United States of America, approval of the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children's Act and the Pediatric Research Equity Act, or the PREA, has resulted in further evaluation and labeling of drugs by the FDA in children through the pharmaceutical industry and through government-sponsored trials. However, pediatric labeling still exists for less than 50% of products. And this results in the use of unapproved medications being a common practice in the care of pediatric patients, which we see every day. The absence of FDA labeling for a specific age group or for a specific disorder does not imply that the use of the drug is unsuitable for that age or for that disorder, but rather that the evidence required by law to allow the inclusion of that group on the label has not yet been acquired. And I do like to make that distinction. And it is a little bit of the conversation that I have with my families when I uh, when we discuss the different alternatives for treatment, um, pharmacological treatment of headache and migraine. For the most recent information on pediatric patient studies, you can visit clinicaltrials.gov. So that's why I included that in the, in the chart if you guys wanted to get the latest and greatest. And the other thing that I like to highlight too for future opportunities is, I think there's always opportunities to advocate for our patients by joining efforts uh, of professional organizations. And within neurology, Headache on the Hill uh, in, uh, and um, Neurology on the Hill, are annual promotional events that happen in Washington DC or now virtually that are organized by the Alliance for Headache Disorders Advocacy and also by the American Academy of Neurology. And these are um, um, advocacy events where physicians get to meet with um, lawmakers and policymakers to, to advocate for the things that we think will be helping our patients and our practice. So I think those are examples of things that you can do outside of the clinic and the exam room that would be helpful for patients. And so we will know that a treatment plan is successful for our patients when the patients and their families have a good understanding of their illness, the cause of the illness, the triggers, the treatment and their prognosis. In addition, I think that the treatment plan will be successful when the patient manages to control their disease with the appropriate pharmacological and non-pharmacological means. And finally, I think in pediatric patients, the treatment plan is successful when the patient is no longer missing school. That is their job. And uh, I think it's important that we support children in their typical environment to stay in school and be successful in school. So I'd like to acknowledge a few of my colleagues who have mentored me and helped me through you know, this journey in medicine and uh, my gratitude to the American Academy of Neurology for inviting me to present in this topic. And I'll take questions if there is any. Thank you very much. When you're seeing a new patient and you've confirmed the diagnosis is migraine and they're appropriate for preventative therapy, what would lead you to prescribing a medication versus focusing on those non-pharmacological measures you talked about at the onset? So my approach is to, to recommend or have a discussion about all of those. And, and I do believe in a shared decision-making um, with the patient and the family. And as I am explaining the different uh, options, it is important to know um, what the feedback from the family is and to know where people are, meet them where they're at and, and kind of like discuss what their boundaries may be and, and know what kind of like um, concerns they have about possible side effects. So for example, if in the conversation, the family says, we really don't like medication and we are anti-medication, we want everything natural. I explain, for example, that while the evidence for nutritional supplements for prevention of migraine is not as much or as rigorous as the evidence for topiramate or amitriptyline, the following nutritional supplements could be used. And, and then I discuss what those nutritional supplements are with magnesium, coenzyme Q10, riboflavin, and we talk about the side effects. And so sometimes I say that, and when I say it's three different supplements, or you could purchase the one bottle that has the one pill that's a little bit more expensive, 
then the family or the patient will say, what do you mean I have to take three pills every day? No, 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 maybe tell me the other options. So it's always a conversation. My role, I think, is to educate patients on what the alternatives are and develop a plan that makes sense. I always tell patients, I'm here to make you better, not to make you worse. So whichever plan we decide today, you can anticipate if you have any issues or problems, you call me, we make adjustments, we change things, or we find a different option. Um, certainly um, considerations about intolerable side effects. And so if somebody comes in and says that they have, a, they have a history of kidney stones, for example, I try to stay away from topiramate and I tell them this medication is very good, but it's a medication that could put you at risk of developing kidney stones. Um, so I would like to suggest that we try something different. And if we need to go back to the medication, then do that. Um, ciproheptadine is another preventive medication that we use. And so if a person is overweight, I mention and I say, you know, there's this medication, it's called ciproheptadine, it can be used, but I tend to not prescribe it in patients who are overweight because it can increase appetite a lot. So that is just an example of what, how the conversations go when I see my patients. Hopefully that answered the question. Yeah. How often do you find yourself using uh, the nutraceuticals? That using what? The nutraceuticals like the, the riboflavins. And because when I, I, did, I haven't done any headache medicine in a long time, but when I did, it seemed like most of the patients were, as you just described them, I don't want medication. Oh, that there's a, a natural thing that can fix it. Let's try that. Yeah. So I started working here at uh, Johns Hopkins in April of this year. I was at uh, Barron Neurological Institute in Phoenix uh, for 10 years before coming here. And I don't know if it is my patient population here. I don't know if the pre-pandemic, post-pandemic um, realities that we live in and information or misinformation about science, I don't know what it is, but I am prescribing nutraceuticals here way more than I remember doing it when I was uh, practicing in Arizona. And, and, and I have done it if, like always, um, but it seems to be like I go through my handouts of nutraceuticals, like just so much more now. Mm -hmm. And I do say to families, anticipate that I am willing to try this with you. I find that if it's going to be effective, you're going to know here in the next two months. So if you find that this medication is getting you to where you need to be, again, hardly ever any headache. When I have a headache, I take my abortive medication. My headache is gone quickly. Then you're golden. But don't anticipate that I had to use the nutraceuticals for six months. And then that's when I started seeing efficacious. I don't find that that is, you know, what I recommend or realistic. So I say, if after a couple of months, you realize it didn't do much for you, then come back and we'll talk about other options. After someone does get to a good place and their seizures or their, uh, sorry, epilepsy, kind of <laughs> getting better, have resolved. When would you consider titrating off of a preventative medication? Yeah, so I always tell my families, it will be my goal that we get to a point where you can come off your daily preventive medication. And while there isn't many um, guidelines or recommendations, or I guess statistically studied um, uh, trials about that, I say practically, let's find a time where you feel confident that you are eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day, drinking lots of water every day, sleeping soundly every night, that we have addressed and managed any other possible comorbidities that you may have, high blood pressure, diabetes, thyroid, or whatnot, um, including those potential stressors that you feel like you know ways in which you can cope with pain, um, that, you know, non-pharmacological ways, and, and that it's the right time, meaning not just before finals or, or not just before like a big trip outside of the country. And so typically during summer breaks or other winter breaks, I say, if you feel like we're there, we can always try. And that is always my goal to try and come off the medication, titrate it up slowly, but surely. Mm -hmm. Do you ever use propranolol as a preventative for children? I have. And um, again, the, the, the level of, I guess, scientific evidence is less. And I typically, let's see if I remember, I typically give the, my patients like the following sequence. And, and so for sure, topiramate FDA approved. And then I say amitriptyline, and then I say ciproheptadine. And then after that, um, I start saying, like listing medications that we have used and that are used. 
um, but that have generally way less level of scientific evidence as far as randomized controlled trials or even um, retrospective studies. And so the antihypertensives are there, so including propanolol and uh, calcium channel blockers, um, the beta blockers, calcium channel blockers like verapamil. The um, antiepileptics are there, so valproic acid, zonisamide, and um, uh, uh, what's it called, um, lamotrigine. Um, and so I, as we continue going down the list, especially for people who do have intractable migraine and who want to continue trying medications, as we continue going down the list, um, I certainly try it and I think about comorbidities. I don't do, do it for a patient who has asthma, right? Um, we think about comorbidities and possible side effects. And so that that um, management is, is, I guess, not different from adults in that regard. One last question before they make me stop this. Um, for abortive <laughs> therapies, do you notice, other than which insurance is going to approve and uh, what meth, uh, mechanism of entry into the body, any major differences amongst the triptans? Any one that you find particularly more effective or less effective? Yeah. So, you know what? Um, generally, there is some data about um, some nasal sprays getting indication because they are superior or non-inferior. So bear with me with the audience that we have here. Um, as you try to get an indication from the FDA for, for getting approval from some of these, some of these medications, you can, um, you can seek approval for not being inferior than what's available out there. Um, and if you're able to prove that you're superior, then that's like you know the cherry on the top. But in, um, in that regards, um, the nasal sprays can be more effective in that they can um, act faster than the medications that a person ingests by mouth. Um, so that's one thing to consider. And again, um, I think that we need to do part two to talk in more detail about each medication and, um, and, and how they may uh, face head to head um, as far as being efficacious or and the possible side effects. But in general terms, it is, again, goes back to the patient and what they find is easier for them to ingest. Um, so even if the sumatriptan can be very efficacious, uh, the patient says that they're very nauseous, then I go to oral disintegrating tablets or nasal sprays um, and not necessarily the sumatriptan, though it's like the quintessential you know, medication that works for most people or could work for most people. Sounds good, thank you. I there are no more active questions, so we'll wrap up. Um, thank you again for coming out and giving this talk. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity very much, and um, I'm available if people want to reach out to me. You all know where I am. Happy to help and answer questions. Yes. Thank you so much.